We could, of course, implement this in our tail directly, but it's sort of error prone and probably quite slow and so on. Uh, and ideally, we should do this before we even start to think about an architecture uh, to some extent. Uh, so yeah, that's sort of the point here. We would like to have some sort of custom world length bit exact simulation. Well, both to sort of determine the world lengths, but also to provide us a reference later. Uh, and as we heard a bit today, probably more tomorrow, and I guess many of you are aware of Python with NumPy and SciPy is probably quite a good alternative to MATLAB. It's much cheaper, if nothing else. So it would be nice to be able to, to sort of write our NumPy SciPy uh, implementation of algorithm and then start introducing finite world lengths. Now it's just for the sake of it so no one doubts it, but even 64-bit floating point numbers have quantization, so that's not the thing, and they will overflow eventually and so on. Yes, so, I mean, but I would still sort of consider those as real numbers because that's what most people do. Um, and of course, people have seen this problem before, so there are some C++ C++ uh, custom word length libraries, so Silings has one, AP types for uh, Vivado, and Siemens Mentor has a actually open source, I think, AC types where you can simulate this in a very good, efficient way. It's pretty fast. The main problem is that it sort of requires recompilation and you need to do extra things if you want to be able to actually look at the numbers. I mean, it's not like you could run it interactively uh, as in NumPy or just plot it or look at the arrays and so on. So, I mean, that's a good idea, but also a bit inconvenient. Uh, of course, people have done this in Python as well. So, there are some fixed point libraries, especially FB binary, FXP math, and a few more. Uh, with machine learning, there's been a few MLD types, is a NumPy extension that defines a number of formats, Gfloat 16, a few different 8 point or 8-bit uh, floating point formats and some short integer formats. But still, that works pretty well if you want that, not if you want an 11-bit integer format or a fixed point format with three fraction bits and so on. Now, of course, fixed point is just integer, but it's still a bit of a hassle to keep track of which bits you should keep and so on. So it yeah, helps at least to have fixed point. There's also like MP Torch, which is a PyTorch extension for quantization and ML training. Uh, and I mean, these are quite good. If you need bfloat16, use MLD type, don't use mine, uh, because mine is more flexible, but therefore slower. Uh, FB binary, really, really fast, but only scalars. FXP math, quite competent, but slow, because in pure Python. So somehow things are either slow, have a limited selection of types, or only support scalars. Uh, so therefore, we have developed API types, uh, which is then basically a NumPy library, but you could specify exactly what data, data type you want. So you have both scalars and array types for both fixed and floating point formats with fully configurable world lengths. Not completely true. We sort of decided that this is not really for like high precision computing. So we decided that floating point numbers could only have 32-bit exponent and 64-bit one piece. So a bit more than usual 64-bit. Uh, fixed point numbers could be any size, even though the purpose is not really to do like 2000 bit fixed point numbers, but you could do that uh, correctly. Uh, so it's implemented in C++, so we get decent performance, and it's sort of the idea that it should be what a algorithm or hardware designer would expect. So it should have total control of everything, it should be bit accurate, and it should be, be more or less just to translate this later to DHDL or something. Uh, and well, sort of made sure that it integrates with the uh, uh, Python. So it interoperates with NumPy, you could plot it using Matplotlib directly, you could use it for CodeDB, uh, the, the data, uh, which is then part of the purpose. So just a sort of example, maybe not a good example, but still if you do this in uh, if I are filter in NumPy, you could maybe load the coefficients and inputs and then you use convolve. You have some result. Computer uses 64-bit floating point. Same thing with API types. You take the same NumPy arrays, say that, okay, I want one integer bits and total seven bits for this. 
and for the, the data you have 16 bit data that you figure out means two integer bits. You could also specify the fractional bits. Two out of three is enough always. Uh, and then you convolve it and then maybe you would like to quantize it to four integer bits and then eight fraction bits here. We call that cost because I mean sometimes you would make it bigger so it doesn't make sense to call it quantize. Sometimes you make it smaller. But you always explicitly tell, now I want to throw away information here. And in this way, one could possibly figure out what is the required uh, number of bits using some other measure. Um, by the way, it also works. You could take this API fixed arrays and use NumPy convolve because NumPy will cast it to floating point and then just go ahead. So I mean, yeah, it works. Not that you should do that, but it works. Uh, and just a sort of reminder, Fixed point number is an integer number, but we say that we have a binary point somewhere in between here, or maybe not even in between, it could be anywhere outside as well. So we have a number of integer bits and a number of fractional bits. So for example, this uh, in binary two's complement would be minus 1.75, that we then would create using well, the bit pattern, that's just for Visualization, three integer bits, two fractional bits. And we have a five bit number that we could then operate on. Uh, and if we do computations with these, we could also just create them. I mean, we don't need to figure out the, the binary representation. We could create them from a float or just from a binary representation or from strings or a few other uh, options. Once we do computations, we will increase the word length. So we'll never overflow or quantize, except for division, because that's pretty hard to avoid. One over three, you cannot avoid quantizing one over three, for example. But apart from that, we will increase. So every time we do an addition, we will add one integer bit, because then it will never overflow. We will select the maximum number of fractional bits. It will multiply, same thing. I mean, so you sum up the word lengths. So in that way, it will never quantize or never overflow. We need to explicitly quantize. But I mean, this is what you would do in hardware. In v well, actually not the first part, but if you multiply in VHDL, for example, you get the length, output length is the sum of these two, uh, input length and so on. And then you select some bits and you could quantize in different ways and you could deal with overflow in different ways and so on. So yeah, you, you have total control of what's happening and it will be bit exact. Floating point, on the other hand, we have a sign, exponent bits, mantissa bits, and well, sort of generalized IEEE 754 standard. And if you read that carefully, there is a bias because the exponent is usually just called an excess representation, so it's a positive number. But then you subtract the bias that has this for all IEEE 754 formats. So it sort of makes sense to do that. So the value of the number looks like this. So the exponent, always positive, subtract the bias. You have a hidden one, and then mantissa, the number of mantissa bits. So that's, yeah, just a sort of definition. So if it's 2.5, for example, uh, or you could just define it in a few different ways here. Uh, and keep the same format. If the operands have the same input format, that means that most of the time some sort of quantization happens. But yeah, that's okay. So for example, 2.5 plus 2.125 happens to be 4.5. But that's exactly the same thing that would happen in floating point numbers. There are easy examples to see that that happens in even 64 bit floating point, even though not for those numbers. Uh, and we decided that for mixed formats, we just take the largest. So the largest exponent bit, the largest mantissa bit. We also have a, we could actually specify the bias as well if we for some reason would like to change the range. Um, and we have some sort of equation how to determine a mixed bias situation. So it, it works if we would like that for some reason. Uh, and yeah, that doesn't work. Yeah, we could also sort of get the binary representation here because clearly this has a binary representation. These numbers is what we see, but maybe we're interested in a bit pattern, so we could obtain that. Uh, but for some reason that went off screen. Uh, we also have array types. 
similar approach. It also leads to matrix multiplication, which apparently, well, all, of course, NumPy supports matrix multiplication, but no other fixed point library actually supported matrix multiplication. And that scales not based on, well, this is floating points, so it based, scales based on the previous, but for fixed points, it's not like if we add up 100 numbers, we don't get 100 extra bits. We get seven extra bits because we guarantee that that's bits and so on. So we select the minimum word length so we guarantee that this data type works. Uh, we could just mix array and scale operations and we can convert back to NumPy array explicitly, but yeah, math.lib and NumPy and so on, if you feed these in, they will convert it uh, automatically for you. In floating point, there are even in IEEE standard four different quantization modes. Normally we can't control those that easily but of course it would be of interest to control them. So in Python, there is a context handling that we have used. So normally we just have round to nearest highest to even, so that's sort of the IEEE default as well. But if we would like to do all computations using round towards negative infinity, we could do the computations in a context like this. And then every computation would then use some different quantization mode instead. So in this way we could control exactly how every computation is done in a rather simple way that we typically can't do with even NumPy and so on, and not these libraries. Uh, and we have 15 different quantization modes, so I dare you to figure out these 15, but the maybe interesting thing is that we also have stochastic quantizations, and some of these quantization modes are just like, okay, we have these, but not that one, so let's add that one. So you can sort of figure out the missing one. Uh, for fun, sort of. But stochastic quantization is, is pretty relevant, especially for short floating point formats, because there is a risk that all machine learning coefficients so on goes towards zero. And that's actually not supported in many libraries either. Uh, and we could control the seeds, so we also have deterministic randomness, or whatever one would call that. Uh, so we also have uh, decent documentation of the quantization modes that one could study. So these are like three of those, the 15. And one can see error distributions and how things round and so on or quantize. Uh, we also have a similar trick for accumulators, for fixed point accumulators, because once we do matrix multiplication, we would do that with full precision, but maybe in a hardware we would like to quantize before we accumulate. Uh, so that we could also control. So uh, normally we would have an accumulator with nine well, 12 fraction bits, because we have five fraction bits here and seven here. So they add up to be 12, but if we now want to model that we quantize before we start accumulating, we could do that. And we could like play around with different things uh, like this, so we could accurately mimic the control, because probably after accumulation we'll still quantize, so maybe we don't need to accumulate with full precision. One minute, okay, quick. Uh, yeah, we could, uh, it integrates pretty well with the Python ecosystem, and if you run like Yupi Notebook or Spider or something, you could actually get Latest rendering, uh, which could be quite pedagogical. Uh, written in C++, pre uh, compiled and tested on all the main platforms. Some SIMD features. Uh, this is the comparison to other libraries, so we like two orders of magnitude, two to three orders of magnitude faster than Python implementations and slightly slower than this scalar only uh, format because it has faster bindings. Uh, we could actually reach more than giga operations per second, thanks to SIMD on fixed point, uh, and unless it sort of goes into multiple words and so on. Uh, floating point not as fast, but still. Uh, I got a text message one hour ago that they had uploaded point two to pip or to PyPy, so if you tried this earlier and it was pretty limited, we have quite a lot of new features released today uh, that are quite useful. Early on the maths worked, but it wasn't really that useful, so we didn't have broadcasting support. You can actually compute with the uh, Python scalars as well, which you shouldn't, but you can. Uh, it will convert them to the corresponding type and then do the operation just as that, so you save a few uh, creations. And yeah, still things to work on. I think that's it. Cool. Or do I have like, yeah? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Check, check. Hello. Hello. Two, two. All right. Um,
congrats on the release. It's good. Right. Always good news. Um, questions? Yeah. Oh, sorry. So this comes from my ignorance from the Python uh, world. So like Amaranth and MyHDL, they just didn't have any fixed point libraries? I mean, they, they folk, I don't know, to be honest. Okay. But I mean, either way, they focus on the hardware. Here they focus on computation that you should focus on before you build the hardware. So I think that's the sort of the, the So they only had signed and unsigned. Yeah, but even point. if they did, it would be a bit of a mess to actually write the architecture. So, so for example, well, matrix multiplication. You have the app, app operator in Python to do matrix multiplication. Solves it. Okay. If you would do it in my HDL, you would need to write the matrix multiply, which you would like to do at some stage, but then you would like to do it with the proper types. I think that would be the answer. Can I do fixed point logarithms, Gaussian logarithms with this? Uh, Nonlinear function we don't have support for because it's like how it depends how would you approximate it. You could write the approximation using this, but I mean, we haven't really, yeah, any nonlinear function because it really depends on how you compute it. You could generate a table and run that if you want. And I mean, we will add some support to do this sort of, yeah, convert to float, compute the function, convert back type of thing. But yeah, that's not really what you implement probably. Yeah. Um, in the fixed point version, can I also do really large numbers with few bits and really small numbers with few bits? So yeah. basically negative integer bits? You can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe I missed this, but uh, if you have like, if you know that uh, some number can only be like maximum 500, for example, yeah. uh, will it understand that it will not need to add like an extra bit uh, for, yeah. can it you can cap? No, you don't have any ranges. It's not interval arithmetic uh, yet at least, but that would of course be interesting as well. But what I mean now is just based on the data type, not the actual value. So for example, that's why we don't have convert this number into whatever binary format, because there isn't whatever binary format in hardware. Uh, I've seen uh, posits uh, being popular. Uh, you're also considering adding them? We have considered it, but we don't think that they are popular enough. Oh. <laughs> uh, yet, I should say. But, uh, one of the, well, the other two guys are my PhD students, and one of them is really keen to add posit, but so far, I, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, implemented in C++ uh, for speed, but can it also be used from C++ as a C++ library? Yes, sort of, but I mean, I don't think that's the purpose. One thing here is that we have dynamic word lengths. Like these other C++ libraries, they have templated uh, word lengths, so they could run much, much faster. We need to check the word length every time we evaluate something. They could do it at compile time. So I would, yeah, you can, but I would still recommend using the other ones. Uh, just because they simulate even faster. Uh, great talk. Uh, I see this library is very useful. Um, so my question would be, did you plug it into an uh, optimization algorithms and could you provide an example where you actually save some bits and without loss of quality? Uh, not with this, but I mean we've done designs where we have 19 bits for certain parts and 12 for others and 37 for yet another. It's just that we didn't do that using this tool. So yeah. I could we, we build like 60 example per second FIR filter for optical communication. And there, for example, most of the time we need 12 bits for data, 10 for coefficient, and 8 for the filter multiplier. So, I mean, that's a typical case that we could, given now that we have complex numbers, which we don't yet have. Uh, was that use case machine learning by any chance? No, no, that was just simulation. Because, I mean, the, the thing is that without loss is like how long is the rope? Because you will have a loss. It's just like how much loss can you accept type of thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I mean, here it's just like, okay, you have three parameters, sweep them, simulate, and pick whatever you think is decent. Cool, all right, fantastic. Thank you, Oscar. Cheers. Thank you.